From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Our uh, co-host David Feldman is on assignment in Cambridge, Massachusetts with his sometime employer, Triumph the Insult Comic Dog. I assume it's more than just following him around with a plastic bag, although it's just a puppet, so I suppose the worst I'll have to pick up is lint. Anyway, hello, Ralph. How are you? Good. And we've got a program today that's going to challenge our listeners. We do. We do. And I have to say, personally, one of my frustrations with mainstream news programs like Meet the Press or Jake Tapper or George Stephanopoulos or any of the countless shows on broadcast and cable is that they all pretty much follow the same format. They talk to a politician and then the host engages with a quote unquote panel of experts. Those experts tend to be partisan political hacks who are there Mm -hmm. to give what they advertise as both sides of the story. And while we do need journalists to talk to our politicians and get them on the record, what's frustrating to me is that these politicians are very good at being, well, politic. In other words, they are very good at not telling you anything. That's how they're wired. They've got their talking points, and that's pretty much it. And then the panel tries to spin all of that nothing in the direction of their own point of view. It's maddening to me. And if I may coin a phrase here, it's it, it's like cotton candy. I, I want to mm-hmm. call it cotton candy journalism. It's sweet. It's pretty. It's well spun. Melts in your mouth immediately and has absolutely no nutritional value. That's why on this show, we very rarely speak to politicians. We speak to mainly journalists, advocates, scholars, and historians. In other words, people actually do stuff. People actually know stuff. People who have studied issues very deeply and are not afraid to share their insights and their experience. And as Ralph suggested, today's program is no exception. On the show today, we are going to be speaking to Duke University history professor Nancy McLean, an award-winning scholar and author whose new book is entitled Democracy in Chains, the Deep History of the Radical Right Stealth Plan for America. There's a lot in that title right there that we're going to get into. In that book, she exposes the uh, Koch brothers' strategy to alter every branch of government so that the country is run by a small minority and the real architect behind their thinking, someone I assure you, you have never heard of before. (laughs) And speaking of people who know stuff, in the second half of the show, we're going to be talking to another professor. This one, a professor of English at Montgomery College in Maryland. Ralph is curious about his experiences with students today, how they are reading, writing, and their grasp of history. So joining us later will be Professor Timothy Wauk, who's going to give us a grassroots view of how young people are learning these days. As always, we will also hear from our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. And if we have time, Ralph will answer more of your listener questions. But first, let's talk to someone who knows stuff. Nancy McLean is a professor of history at Duke University and an award-winning scholar of the 20th century United States. A prolific author on that subject, her new book is Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Right Stealth Plan for America, and it tells the story of right-wing academics and out-of-control big money. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Professor Nancy McLean. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Welcome, indeed. Well, having read this book... The first question that comes up in my mind is the enormous energy of the Koch brothers and their allies in academia and law schools to change the agenda, to change what's discussed, and to go after what they call socialists uh, or the Democratic Party, and to energize their supporters in Congress, and even to get more of them elected. And the first question I want to ask of you, Professor McLean, is where is the energy on the other side? The other side has its billionaires. There's George Soros. Mm-hmm. There was the late Peter Lewis. There were many people, including on many issues, Warren Buffett. They just don't seem to have the energy to change the dialogue, the discussion, produce new leaders, thought leaders, doers. Did that occur to you in the book? Because I didn't see anything in the book on that. I mean, the book Mm -hmm. was not on that. It was on 
the transformation led by James Buchanan of George Mason University and mm -hmm. his funder, Charles Koch. But did that occur to you in, in the research? Is just a lack of energy. George Soros, who really knows what democracy is all about, he, had, mm -hmm. he started the Open Society Institute. He lived under fascism in Europe, under mm -hmm. communism in Europe. More than any rich person, he understands the prerequisites of a democratic society in the open mind, but they don't seem to have the energy and the country's paying the price. Your reaction? Yeah, well, I think part of the problem is that folks on the other side, the left side, the progressive side, have not really understood what's been going on on the right. I think there's been a great deal of complacency, a great deal of short-term focus, you know, looking to the next election or to the next local or, you know, state campaign for a particular issue. And the left has been very siloed and not thinking about big picture, kind of world-changing ideas in the way that the right has. You're absolutely right about that. On the other hand, I would say that in the year since the book came out, and it's just about a year next week, I have been traveling nonstop around the country speaking to varied audiences. And what I've been struck by, particularly among people in motion, you know, people who already identify, you know, as activists, who are thinking about social change, who are veterans of various efforts, is that people are really getting it. They're understanding that we are facing right now an existential threat to our democracy, that it is coming from billionaires on the right who are deeply ideological and have played a very long and sophisticated game that we have missed. And there is a great will to not only rethink deep questions and come up with a vision for the country that might be unifying, but also to get out of the silos and make new alliances and see connections between groups and issues in a way that we have not seen in, in my lifetime. So I'm excited and invigorated by that, but it is very much at the you know early tentative formative stages. Mm -hmm. Well, the test of your observations going around the country will be the November elections for members yes. of Congress, of course, because the Koch brothers, they're really the complete menu. I mean, they mm -hmm. want ideological change. They want the media to respond to them. They want to elect people in Congress. They want to get corporatist judges at the federal level. They work with this group, ALEC, which has changed mm -hmm. its name to get bills passed in state legislature after state legislature. They have seminars. They have conferences. They fund people in the past, like Henry Manny, who was a law professor at George Mason, to bring what you say in your book, 40% of the federal judiciary came to those nice watering holes, nice resorts, to get exposed to this kind of indoctrination. So let's back up a minute before I really dig into this. Because I think that this effort has huge vulnerabilities because they're self-contradictory. Mm -hmm. Democracy actually increases GDP. It increases corporate profits. And all you have to do is compare, historically, Brazil with the mm -hmm. U.S., roughly the same size territory, colonized about the same time, full of natural resources. They may have more iron than we do, and we may have oil and gas but they've discovered some in recent years. And because they were a plutocracy, a monarchy, a dictatorship, you know, 20 years ago, I figured out that the entire GDP of Brazil, with 175 million people then, was less than the GDP of California from San Francisco down mm -hmm. through Los Angeles to the Mexican border. And at mm -hmm. that time, California in that area had about 25 million people. So before we get to this bizarre contradiction, because mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. these people want are more profits and more wealth in few hands, give us your thesis here. What do these people want, all the way from the Koch Brother Industries and George Mason's bought mm -hmm. university to the Congress and to the federal courts? What kind of society do they want? What do they want to destroy specifically? Right. Well, this libertarian vision shared by Charles Koch and James Buchanan, the economist you mentioned, and the top operatives who are architects of this effort, 
would like to bring into being a libertarian society. Their libertarian utopia would have no place for essentially the kinds of changes that citizen action has won over the course of the 20th century, really from the progressive era forward. Things like government regulation of corporations to stop pollution, discrimination, lack of product safety, to undercut workers' power to organize together for collective voice, to undercut social insurance like Social Security and Medicare. So it is really an absolutely sweeping vision. It is stunning that anyone would imagine trying to impose this in the modern world because it is such an unpopular vision when people understand it. Only about 3 or 4% of the population at the most identifies with libertarian thought. But because of the money that the Koch Donor Network has and has been able to amass with their hundreds of other donors who have contributed to this, it is actually feasible for them to try to alter the course of our country. And so what I take to be the most significant of my findings is the repeated statement by Charles Koch, by Buchanan, by other key figures in this project that they are acting in the way that they are acting precisely because they understand that they are a permanent minority, that they will never persuade the majority of the population of their ideas in an open contest of ideas. But and you, so you point out, though, you point out they rely on a stealth strategy, you know, to, to yeah, promote we're, we're the myth of voter fraud. Right. Okay. Yeah, we're going to get to that. But you point out in your book that it's more than traditional libertarianism because it's not Ron mm -hmm. Paul type libertarianism. Ron mm -hmm. Paul does not want concentration of power in a few hands. It seems to be a masked type libertarianism for plutocratic driven policies and actions. Isn't I mean, they really want power in a few hands. That's not what libertarians want. Well, they would say that they don't, of course, but their actions suggest very much that they do. And we can see what the combined operations that are Koch funded have done to our country, particularly since the 2010 midterms. You were mentioning the 2018 midterms coming up. But since that period, they have won control over 30 states of the country, obviously over all branches of national government. And in every part of that power structure, they have been pushing measures that undermine the power of ordinary people, particularly workers, consumers, civil rights, feminists, etc., and exaggerate the power of corporations. So I quite agree with you that it's a kind of pseudo-libertarianism, but at the same time, I think it is important to point out that they have, through their monies, co-opted all the major institutions of libertarianism. All the formal institutions of libertarianism in this country now are dominated by Koch monies, Koch network monies, and are pushing this kind of agenda from the Cato Institute to the Reason Foundation, the Independent Institute, and on and on and on. And of course, ALEC and the other groups you mentioned. Well, one thing about the Koch brothers is they speak with forked tongues. For example, mm -hmm. they put ads in newspapers that they're against corporate welfare, what they call crony capitalism, mm -hmm. namely taxpayer subsidies, handouts, giveaways, bailouts of business, like the Wall Street bailout. But then on the other hand, they're taking all kinds of corporate welfare. I mean, they have a, a gigantic conglomerate deep in the tar sands, oil and gas in Canada and elsewhere, they have tried to tax solar energy panels by pushing bills and mm -hmm. legislatures in the South. They haven't been very successful with that. So they don't really walk the talk. They do say that they're for civil liberties and LBGT rights and so forth, but they don't really walk the talk. They have never challenged the military budget, which right. is full of waste of taxpayer mm -hmm. resources. Ron Paul has challenged the military budget. Mm -hmm. They want to close off access to the courts, therefore mm -hmm. restriction on tort, wrongful injury, right. lawsuits, for example. Ron Paul wants to open up access. Mm -hmm. So I like this to have the language really focus on corporatism. This is about mm -hmm. corporatism. They say they're against statism, but they're not. They want the government to serve and enrich them and to deny and impoverish the mass of the people. Don't you think that's really their approach? 
Well, I think the freedom that really matters to them is economic freedom, right? And this is a cause that is about economic liberty. And I describe it in the book as being committed to property supremacy in their application of these ideas. And so the idea is that the rights of property or corporations should trump other rights, human rights, such as, you know, the right to be free from discrimination in the workplace or environmental protections, such as the right to clean air and water and so forth. So I like to think of it as property supremacy. And I think that is a helpful way of seeing it. I will say, I think there is a tendency on the left to not take them seriously as ideologues. And a lot of these guys aren't, you know, a lot of these guys are on the gravy train for what they can get from it. But I do believe that Charles Koch is a serious ideologue and a serious intellectual in his way, who has been studying ideas for six decades now. He's been funding hundreds of libertarian intellectuals trying to find a way to break through with this strategy. And I think that we have to take the ideas on on their merits and challenge the ideas directly. And I say that also because they are reaching out in an unprecedented way to young people in particular. They have so much money that they are pushing into campuses, they are funding faculty positions, they are creating centers, and they are bringing thousands of young people into paid internships, into positions in this system, and they're doing that, actually even calling themselves the freedom movement. So I think that it's crucial to really dig into the ideas themselves and show how the libertarianism promoted by the Kochs has actually become a deadly dogma. And I think we see that most obviously in their funding of climate science denial and misinformation. They seem to be on a self-destruction path because if they get rid of Social Security, Medicare, they get rid of government health and safety regulation, Mm -hmm. they change the tax system so they're rarely taxed, although they're pretty low taxed at the present time. And they basically undermine the democratic pillars of a society, Mm -hmm. they're going to shrink the economy. They're going to shrink consumer demand. They don't want a living wage. Well, a living wage means people have more money to spend to buy the products of the plutocracy and the oligarchy. So doesn't that sink into them that authoritarian regimes almost invariably have lower GDP per capita than stronger democracies? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's been true historically all over the world. And if Charles Koch is such an intellectual, and Mm -hmm. he's got three engineering degrees from MIT, number one, don't they understand that historically and economically? And number two, if they were really libertarians, they would debate the other side. They would debate progressives. So two Mm -hmm. questions. Don't they understand that they are basically cutting the roots of economic prosperity, which produces the quantitative amount of their profits? And why haven't they engaged the other side in debates? Have they debated you, for example? Okay, so two things. One is, as I said before, I believe that these ideas, you know, are, you know, could be fertile, could be useful to think with. But at this stage, given the way they're being funded by this huge Coke donor network and this apparatus of literally hundreds of organizations, if you include the state and the international ones, this has, it has become a deadly dogma. And I quite agree with you that it is leading to an utterly unsustainable society, certainly environmentally, in that we have a small window to act on what's happening to our planet, but also economically, socially, in, in public health terms. And I believe, frankly, psychically, this would be an untenable society. But no, they seem not to understand this. And I think it by the crudest measure, in terms of their ability to continue profiting, it's important to recognize that they no longer look to nation states, right? They don't care, frankly, about what happens to American workers or American communities because they're looking to a vast world, to all the consu- you know, millions of consumers in China. You mentioned Brazil and other places. And I think they think they can flourish there. And as I suggest in the conclusion, they've been quite clear that they think America will reach the point when we have Brazilian-style favelas in our cities and we have water of the quality of Flint in other places. And clearly, they don't care because they think that that will create the incentives and the drive to reinvent capitalism. I think it's insane. (laughs) And that's why I'm spending so much time traveling around and speaking out against it. But I think they believe in it 100%. Now, I will say they do like to debate, but they like to debate in frivolous terms. They like to debate these ideas about as honestly and in good faith faith as they debate climate science. 
Well, by the way, for our listeners, we're talking with Professor of History at Duke University, Nancy McLean, the author of a widely acclaimed and reviewed book, actually, Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Right Stealth Plan for America. Before we talk about how you got into the archives of James Buchanan and saw all these confidential exchanges with Charlie Koch and others at the former clapboard house where Professor Buchanan, the late Professor Buchanan lived, I want to raise something about this mark of fundamentalism. It is saturated in hypocrisy. There is no free market when you do not have freedom of contract. We've lost our freedom of contract, compliments of people like the Koch brothers and others, under the fine print situation. People don't consent to give up their rights to go to court. People don't consent to be charged $200 to change their reservations on Delta Airlines and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's one infirmity of any theory of the free market by these people. Another one is all the subsidies they get, bailouts, handouts, giveaways, all the subsidies. Mm -hmm. You can't have a free market and have these subsidies. And you can go on and on. They have regulation in government that favors them against consumers. We used to be called cartel regulation (laughs) and other forms of regulation that their lobbyists get. So they're walking hypocrites here. They don't want a real free market, and that's why they've rigged it all these years, monopolistic practices, deceptive practices, and so forth. So why aren't the progressives taking them apart here? I mean, Bob Kuttner, who's written books and who you know, has just Mm -hmm. written a book, Can Democracy Survive Capitalism Globally?, He's tried to do some of that, but I'm I'm really appalled at the lack of response to take these people apart. I mean, I debated Henry Manny at Princeton many years ago. He's oh, a right wing law that. professor, uh-huh. mm-hmm. and he didn't do very well. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't understand yeah. how they've gotten this far with a totally phony, hypocritical ideology spearheaded by James Buchanan, the professor of economics at George Mason, who. I don't know how he got the Nobel Prize, but on page 142 in your book, you say that his academic record was characterized, among other things, by rejecting empirical research. (laughs) Yep. Yes. (laughs) As I said, it's a dogma at this point. There are people within it who make a show of doing empirical research at this point, but most of it, I think, is pretty skewed by their prima facie assumptions about how things work and how they should work. So it is a mystery to me that they have been given as much of a free pass as they have. There are people attacking these ideas, but the people who are attacking the ideas, I think, have not yet understood the full throttle attack on democracy as we know it that is coming from these people. And I think once people begin to grasp that, then they'll find their voices. And again, you know, I see this kind of thing bubbling up when I'm around the country with different kinds of audiences. I've seen it among religious people. I've seen it among human rights activists, environmentalists, labor unionists, community groups, civil rights groups, feminists, indivisible groups. All of these groups are saying we have to stand up against these people. We have to articulate our own narrative about what a good economy is, about what a good society is, and we have to defend our democracy from all of the attacks that these people are waging. But we're not hearing that from our political class in the way that we should. And I don't know what that is. You know, I mean, partly it probably has to do with funding. Partly it has to do with the fact that people's eyes are so closely focused on what's going on inside the beltway that they're not looking elsewhere. You know, there are many causes of it, but I think that there is something kind of welling up out at the grassroots that may be our hope, which is that they can focus on these crucial questions that you're saying the establishment has not addressed. Well, the Democratic Party over the years just uh, basically defaulted. I mean, it allowed this Mm -hmm. to happen. You can see it in the Congress. You've written extensively about Congressman Dick Armey in your Mm -hmm. book from Texas. And I was watching and interacting with people in, in the House of Representatives at that time. And it was amazing how the Democrats, they ridiculed him. But they never tangled with him because they thought he was such a nutty former economics professor. There's this ridicule approach that, in effect, gives these people a free pass 
and a free highway to roar their juggernaut, not mm -hmm. just from books and articles and ideologies, but into lawsuits up to the Supreme Court and into legislation through Congress. And I don't know whether it's kind of hubris on the part mm -hmm. of liberals and progressives that they think these people are so nutty that they can just be ridiculed with humor on Jon Stewart's program, but not yeah. engaged. In the meantime, these so-called nutty people are laughing all the way to the bank. I mean, they're, they, yeah, as you say, I, they control state legislatures, most of the governorships, all the Congress, Supreme Court, you know, yeah. the president. Now, let's talk about I could about not agree with you more on that, by the way. It's, it's a deep embedded problem at this point, this ironic posturing yeah. on the left, this being above it all, you know, joking and laughing and poking fun, and the sense you get of these people who imagine themselves to be the smartest people in the room, who cannot understand that there are others who have a much deeper long-term strategy that is undermining the very ground on which they stand. And I think if we could break through that smugness and break through that complacency and get people to realize that they may not have all the answers and that other people are building a kind of a chokehold, really, around all the sources of progressive power while they're engaged in their ironic laughter and posturing. If we could break through that smugness, we might just get somewhere. Well put. Where are the Koch brothers and where is Buchanan on foreign and military policy, which we now call the American Empire? So glad you asked that. Buchanan, yes, styled himself a libertarian, detested all of these things that were going on in domestic policy. The phrase his school of thought used for people who went to government to seek anything from old age benefits to, you know, lower class size and better wages for teachers, as we've seen in the red state protests, labeled all of those folks rent seekers, meaning that they were going, in Buchanan's terms, going to government for things that they could not get as an individual from the market. And he described that as parasitical and portrayed wealthy people as the prey of such predators. And these are his words, not mine. So that was his language, and yet he only applied it to domestic groups, right? He did not apply that at all. There was no critique of empire of U.S. foreign policy. Quite the opposite. He supported the most aggressive kinds of U.S. foreign policy. So total blind spot, you know, no sense that the military and industrial complex might be rent-seeking, where the analysis really <laughs> did apply. So none of that from him. Now, I will say that in the early years, in the 1970s, for example, when Charles Koch was really starting to get active politically and funding, you know, the Cato Institute and trying to build up a libertarian cadre, at that point, he insisted on radicalism, right, and was very clear that they were not conservative. They were contemptuous, actually, of conservatives. And at that point, there was a critique of the military. But since then, they realized that to get anything accomplished and to actually get power, they would have to make alliances with people people whose numbers were greater. And that, of course, is the religious right and the broader kind of Republican base. And so they've largely shut up about those foreign policy criticisms and those criticisms of empire in order to move that base to push the ball down the field so that they can get the power they want. Although I will say this America first agenda that we're seeing from Trump, this is the old libertarian rights interwar foreign policy. So I think if our journalists had any sense of history, they would begin to explore that a little bit more. Except for the huge expansion of the military budget and empire. That, yes. uh, Trump is very, very consistent with the Wall Street view of our economy and the military industrial complex, which he champions and which, uh, as you know, President Eisenhower warned about. But let's crank in Wall Street here. You mm -hmm. see, I interact quite often with Cato Institute and others because I wrote this book, Unstoppable, the emerging left-right alliance to dismantle the corporate state. So they invited me over there. And the Heritage Foundation in the past has come out with reports against corporate welfare, crony capitalism. So has the Cato Institute. Mm -hmm. But I've come to realize, Professor McLean, that they're not really serious, that that's nowhere near their priority. They've just put out the reports so they can assume they're intellectually consistent. But the money that they get has another agenda, which is a very, very strict maximizing profit, reducing or getting rid of regulations, reducing taxes, and allowing Wall Street to continue to speculate with other people's money under more deregulation. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think they're really honest with that. The only 
congressional hearing in American history on corporate welfare was one I stimulated when John Kasich was congressman Mm -hmm. from Ohio, and he was the chair of the House Budget Committee. And he invited, at my request, Grover Norquist, who, of course, doesn't want any taxation but doesn't challenge the military budget. And Mm -hmm. Grover Norquist testified against corporate welfare. But he hasn't done much with it at all. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the old-fashioned plutocracy, oligarchy, Wall Street, empire, Mm -hmm. just under different guises. And these Mm -hmm. guys are just trying to look better by trying to be more intellectually consistent. But they don't really follow through on the consistency. Where they really follow through is on corporate domination of our political economy in fewer and fewer global corporate hands. Right. I agree. I think Paul Krugman yesterday in his piece in the Times hit the nail on the head in talking about the bad faith of the intellectuals on the right. And I think that applies to the kind of people that you're talking about as well, in that they will make gestures in the direction, as you're saying, of critiquing corporate welfare. And yet what they and their allied operations do is at every point boost the power of corporations to be free from any accountability to the public. And here I think it's really important important that we not see any of these entities as though they're islands, right? So the Cato Institute, you know, is connected to ALEC, is connected to the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, you know, is connected to the groups that are promoting the myth of voter fraud in order to disenfranchise people. Is con- You know, I mean, they're, they're all working different pieces of this thing, and yet they can maintain plausible deniability when you try to hold them culpable for their connections to those other pieces of the operation. But I think we see this particularly where they control state politics, as they do in 30 states now, including my own North Carolina. As you've said, there has been no effort whatsoever to do anything serious about corporate welfare, but there has been an effort to devastate the public schools, right, to siphon all this money off to unaccountable, unregulated charter schools, to undermine environmental protection, to take away voting rights, not just from African Americans, the legally actionable case, but also from low-income seniors of all races, from young people in particular on college campuses. I mean, all of this stuff is working together. And I think our journalists have done us, not all of them, there's some amazing people out there, but the mainstream of American journalism has done us a terrible disservice in not connecting the dots for us and not asking the questions that would, for example, help the American people understand how the Koch agenda is moving through rapidly under the Trump administration. The only place they're really reporting is how much money the Koch brothers are pouring to their political action committees into elections. The Koch brothers, by the way, are open about what they're spending. They're going to spend $400 million yep. for the November election. Where is it on the other side here, on the liberal and progressive with George Soros and others? I don't know. But I do know the press does focus, not only the New Yorker and Jane Mayer, but mm-hmm. they do focus on the flow of money, mm-hmm. but not much else. You're quite right. Yes. Let's ask about your experience. When this book came out, it was fairly positively reviewed in the New York Times and elsewhere. Have you been on PBS, public radio? Have you been on any of the national talk shows on the commercial Mm -hmm. networks? The only exception is Democracy Now! I was on, and I've been on a slew of radio shows, but about three weeks after publication, and as you said, the book was getting very positive review attention everywhere, you know, in, in lots of leading outlets, great buzz. And then these Koch-funded professors and operatives set to work, pumping smog out into the atmosphere in the same way that they do against climate scientists. And they created this illusion of great controversy about my book and about my research findings and even my reputation. And they created so much smog that it I think it confused people for a time, and I don't know, you know, if this is would be the case, but given the initial reception of the book, it seems strange that it wasn't picked up by the kinds of national TV outlets that you're talking about. But this Coke network is very sophisticated about trying to take out anybody who brings bad news to them, and they actually have a phrase for it that I quote in the book. They call it's an economics euphemism, and they call it raising the transaction costs 
for the other side. <laughs> so, so they actually joke about that. And they, some great researchers, young researchers from Greenpeace and Uncoke My Campus, did a media tracker on the book and found that 91 attacks on me had come from these Coke-funded faculty members and operatives who failed to disclose their conflicts of interest and their dependence on Coke money in making their attacks. But, you know, those attacks created, definitely created some smog. On the other hand, I can say there's also the irony of unintended consequences that in attacking the book as viciously and as vehemently as they did, they alerted a lot of people that this was more than an ordinary book. And lots of people wrote me and said, I saw those guys attacking you and I could see who they were and what they were about. So I got the book and read it. I should say. But, you know, I keep emphasizing how dishonest their Mm -hmm. agenda is because they know full well throughout history what saves capitalism is socialism. That is government Mm -hmm. bailout. Look what Franklin Roosevelt did during the Depression. And they always go to governments all over the world when they get in trouble, these global capitalists, and they want to be bailed out. So this idea of, you know, shrinking government to a level where you can wash it down in a bathtub, the way Grover Norquist has said, is total nonsense. When these people prevail, they're going to prevail by combining the control of giant corporations with control of government against Mm -hmm. the people who have delegated their power to the Congress and state legislatures under the respective constitutions. Well, we don't want to leave the listeners with pessimism here. You know there is an effort of a group on campus to counteract the strings attached grants of the Koch brothers to various universities. There's an uproar now at George Mason University, for example. And second, I'm sure you know Professor of Law Joel Rogers, University of Wisconsin in Madison. He started a group of scholars to draft laws to be submitted to supportive legislators in state capitals, counteracting the ALEC lobby of the Koch brothers. you want to mm-hmm. discuss that? Yeah, absolutely. I, and I will say that it may sound bizarre or perverse, <laughs> for me to say this, but I actually feel hopeful at this moment because I think that the crisis that these folks have brought us to, which includes the election of Donald Trump, which would be utterly unimaginable without all that Buchanan's ideas and Koch's money had done, you know, in the run up to that election, that has really woken people up in a quite significant way. And you pointed to two areas that I think are crucial sources of hope. One of them is this brilliant group of young people who have created a group called Uncoke My Campus. <laughs> they have a fabulous website. They are among the best research on the Coke donor network. They're doing organizing on dozens of campuses around the country where Coke is trying to implant these centers that will be part of the political project. They're phenomenal, so I urge your listeners to check out the website of Uncoke My Campus and find ways to connect with and support them if they're interested. We've had them on our program. Oh, yeah, you have? Oh, good. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize oh, yeah. that. That's great. I only learned about them after the book came out, but I have just been trumpeting them everywhere because I'm so impressed with them since I've met them. And then you mentioned Joel Rogers, and there is actually a broader effort underway now to start thinking about how to unchain democracy with with precisely the kinds of measures that you're talking about that we have needed for a very long time since you first set to work, you know, years ago with unsafe at any speed, which is measures to control money and politics, measures to ensure that we have transparency, democratic accountability, and hold Democrats as well as Republicans' feet to the fire on all those kinds of things, things like independent redistricting, you know, all the things that we need to restore and renew democracy and make it real an operative, perhaps for the first time in our history. So I do think there are many efforts underway that are exciting and that people can plug into, and I hope that they will, because I really do believe this is an all-hands-on-deck emergency for the future of our society and our democracy. We've been talking with Professor Nancy McLean, author of the acclaimed book, Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Right Stealth Plan for America. And one thing that's unique about the book, listeners, is If you don't want to read the whole book, she has a a very detailed 20-page introduction that gives the theme of the book, not the excitement of the book. You have to read the entire book. She also has 80 pages of footnotes to document what she's writing about. Well, thank you very much, Professor Nancy McLean, author of Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Right Stealth Plan for America. 
dug right into the deep archives of Professor Buchanan's work, as well as the network that was built up by the Koch brothers, and going all over the country trying to arouse the people with a context that is historical and it is very, very tutorial. Thank you very much, Professor McLean. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thanks for having me You're with welcome. you. We've been speaking to Professor Nancy McLean, author of Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Right Stealth Plan for America. We will link to that and more Professor McLean's work at RalphNaderRadioHour.com, as in addition to Uncoke My Campus, which we'll put on the website also. But when we come back, we're going to speak to another college professor who I was told Ralph met recently on an airplane trip. Ralph was so impressed with the conversation they had, he invited him on the show. And before we find out what that's all about, let's check in with Russell Mokhyber over at the National Press Building in Washington, D.C. Back after this. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, June 8, 2018. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Inchcape Shipping Services will pay $20 million to settle allegations that it knowingly overbilled the U.S. Navy for services provided to Navy ships from 2005 to 2014 in ports around the world. Inchcape, one of the world's largest providers of marine support services, is headquartered in the United Kingdom and is a subsidiary of the Istimar World Investment Firm and the Dubai government-owned Dubai World. The whistleblowers, who are Inchcape executives, will receive $4.4 million, or 22% of the settlement proceeds. The lawsuit alleged that the whistleblowers resigned from the company after discovering the alleged multi-million dollar overbilling scheme and bringing it to the attention of the company's CEO. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with Ralph. Our next guest is also a college professor. Timothy Woke is a faculty member of English Language at Montgomery College. He also works at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where he teaches freshman composition to ELL students. ELL stands for English Language Learners, which is a class for students whose native language is not English. In addition, he is the co-author of Making English Grammar Meaningful and Useful. When I was doing my research, I have to admit this, one of the first things that came up was rate my professors on my search, Uh, which is kind of a Yelp-type website for students checking out teachers. And this is what one of the students said about Professor Woke. Mr. Woke is the best and most well-prepared professor that I have had so far. His many years of teaching experience and his knowledge make him always try to find the best and easiest way to help students in the learning process. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Professor Timothy Woke. Thank you. Professor Woke, when we were on that plane, I was impressed by the way you described the incoming students to Montgomery College and other institutions that you teach at. And one of the things you said is that the students write the way they talk. What do you mean by that? Yes, well, this is commonly referred to as the readiness gap. So particularly at two years, some policy institutes put that number at around 60%. So at community colleges, when students arrive, they take a placement exam, and if they don't score high enough, they get placed into developmental education programs, which are non-credit programs, and they, they kind of have the purpose of serving a college prep curriculum that some students get in high school, but not all students, of course. So in those courses, oftentimes the students don't come to college with the skills, the writing skills, or even the cultural skills to navigate higher education. So I meant that exactly as I said it. Very often I will receive essays where it's very colloquial, the spelling is what, you know, what I would refer to as text English. And we're really starting at ground zero of teaching students what an essay is. And also the cultural dimension is extremely important. Some basic things that I think probably a lot of people take for granted, such as note taking or emailing professors or coming to professors' office hours. I have many students who arrive in class with no notebook, no anything, and very low writing ability. And it's our job in these developmental courses to get them ready to be successful in the credit courses and pursue the kinds of degrees they want. You've noted that over the last 20 years, there has been a decline. Do you want to describe that? Is this due to all the cell phone technology, the hours looking at screens? I I mean, Uh, 
from my, you know, subjective experience, I would say, yes, you know, there's some interesting statistics on young people and their ability with technology. And sure, they're very good at some dimensions of using technology. However, very often, my students at least, they don't have the first idea about how to approach research using libraries databases or even Google Scholar, or they don't even really know how to do a Google search to get the answer that they want. And then another very crucial dimension of that is differentiating the kind of content that they find. They don't really have, you know, the, the Facebook News and NPR are the same thing to them. And sure, they're very savvy with the actual procedures of using technology. But I do think that, yes, all the social media consumption and the kind of writing that they do outside of school, and particularly for this group who never got trained in the formal writing that's required in college in high school, they're learning it for the first time and their only frame of reference is whatever they're doing on their phones usually. And kind of breaking that habit is extremely difficult because these are young adults and a lot of these things are fossilized in their minds. And so it's very important to show them, okay, this is what you're doing, but this is what we need to do to be able to move on to the credit courses. What's this say about the high schools? How do they get through high school? We're well, so well un unready. I, I, yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not a K through 12 expert, but I will say that, you know, I think that maybe a lot of people in the U.S. think that a high school diploma means college readiness, but we know statistically that's not true. It should be true, probably, but if a student is not in college prep curriculum in high school, what that student needs to produce to receive a high school diploma, it, there's a big disconnect between that and what is required in college. And by college, from a writing standpoint, I mean first-year composition. So first-year composition, whether at two or four-year schools, it's a very rigorous class, and everyone who doesn't take AP English in high school has to take it. And these students are very far away from the point to be able to pass those classes. And I think that that comes from not having a college prep curriculum for everyone in high school. It's only, you know, any high school that does tracking, obviously it's the high track students that take these college prep curriculum courses. And then these students usually end up at the four-year schools because those schools require that. Whereas a lot of, that's a big problem to the kind of the psychological dimension. I have a lot of students who are kind of bitter about having to take these courses because they're non-credit. And they cost money and they're a lot of time and very often students fail them and have to take them multiple times before they're able to move on to credit courses. So they come to college thinking they get into college because, you know, a two-year school just requires a high school diploma, but they're not prepared to succeed in college. And they come to us and, in, you know, it's, it's an uphill battle in these developmental courses. Do you have problems with students playing around with their cell phone, checking text messages, the weather, shopping, yeah, yeah, uh, playing video yeah. games. Do you allow that in your class? I, we're not supposed to, but I do only when it's guided by me. For example, using a dictionary or or looking something up, but absolutely not. And and that that definitely is a problem. Just getting them to put their phones down for five minutes. I mean, some professors even collect phones, and I'm not against that at all. I mean, it is a problem, but I try to show them, hey, you know, for example, there's a, a great online dictionary called the Longman Dictionary, and it kind of shows them how words that they use and academic words are used by native speakers. So even if they are native speakers, so I will have them use their phones if they want. If we're in a computer room, they can use that too, but to look up words. And I try to get them in the habit for using their phones, not just for whatever they're doing and just waiting for the next text or whatever they're posting on breaks, but to use it for something that's going to directly help them. And some students pick it up. They get in the habit. Hey, I'll just look up these words. Professor Woke underlined this word and said I'm not using it correctly. Now I can look it up on my phone and I can learn how to use it correctly and I can avoid that error next time in my writing. It's definitely a problem. Tell us your distinction between literacy and illiteracy you know, among young people. Well, this is changing, of course, with all the kind of writing online. There's some really cool things where people are – even in first year, in traditional first year comp courses, those are changing and they're allowing students to write in different ways. And I think that's a good thing. However, we know that any major that a student goes into, that student is going to have to write traditional research papers. And so we have the obligation to train them to do that, even if we allow them to kind of use the kind of writing as well that they're familiar with and comfortable with. 
For example, some professors have students publish different things online in different kind of formats using images. I mean, there's a lot of new ways that we can call writing. But literacy to me, it has to mean the traditional form of literacy where we have to teach them to write in standard American English according to the traditional research paper because it's a disservice if we don't as they maybe math majors don't have to write research papers I'm, I'm unsure but pretty much any major we can think of kind of one of the end final outcomes is going to be a big research paper in that discipline and we have to prepare them for that so all the essay writing obviously even teaching them the concept of using sources and even teaching I mean not how to plagiarize is, is a big thing too I guess and let me say that about the you know, their reliance on technology. A lot, a lot of them really don't understand the differentiation between pulling things from the internet and writing them themselves. So even breaking that kind of habit and saying, this comes from the internet, this comes from your mind, but nonetheless, preparing them for formal academic research writing is, is crucial to them getting a degree. Do they read the newspapers at all? Do they read any books outside of class, actual print books? N not in my experience, no, and that's that's another thing. So so we have them do it. We read short articles from. I mean, online media is a great thing to use for writing topics. So even teaching them about the Washington Post, about NPR, about Pew Research, and having them kind of look up issues. And it's it's another way of saying. Oftentimes, I try to give them as much leeway as possible in choosing topics. Hey really find something you're interested in and then let's actually do a little bit of research in some online newspapers. But as far as kind of convincing them to do that outside of class, it's, it's a tough sell. The highly motivated student will do it, of course. I, if I say, listen to NPR every day and your English will be a lot better in six months and the student will say, okay, and, and do that. And that's wonderful. But the rest, you know, it's really, they're really, a lot of them are really into social media or they're into just other kinds of communication with their friends and they're not necessarily interested in consuming information about their majors. They need to be in those credit courses. They, they have to be, but we do that too in these developmental courses. I mean, we use content and we have them read it and we try to pick good content and we have them learn to write about it. And again, just having them, learn about something that they're interested in can be a great thing. I, I use TED a lot too. And if they can find a video even that they, they like that's about something academic, then it's a great thing for us. Do you find at Montgomery Community College, which is one of the better community colleges in the country, I, I might add, that there's a video game addiction problem among some of the students? I don't, with my students, I don't really notice that. It's more the social media or just you know, texting or communicating, whatever they're doing on their phones. I mean, I've had a lot of, I, I actually, <laughs> kind of amusing story. I had one student a couple of years ago who was so bad on his phone. It, it was, you know, every class, like 10 times I had to tell him to get off his phone. And then I asked him what he was doing and he showed me his social media profiles and he had, he had tens of thousands of followers and likes. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So I, I taught him about FOMO, the fear of missing out. And I actually had him find an article about it and write a paper about it. And he actually loved it. So that, that turned out really because he kind of got to explore his own interaction with social media. So that was a really positive thing. But of course, that doesn't always happen. But I don't really, at least in class, I don't really see anything concerning video games. But the being on their phones is, is definitely a huge problem. Well, we're out of time, but we do want to expand this discussion in later programs, Professor Woke. And I want to thank you very much because one of the reasons the students like you so much is at their best, they learn that you show them how to educate themselves. And you just gave an example with that student. So thank you very much. How would anybody reach you? Probably email is the best. Anyone can email me at twowk one at um bc.edu, which is my uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County email address. And I'd like to thank you very much for having me on the show. This has been a great pleasure. You're welcome. To be continued. Thank you. Okay. Hope so. Take care. We've been speaking to Timothy Woke, English language professor at Montgomery College. Check out his bio on ralphnaderradiohour.com. All right. We have time now to do a little update. This is from uh, a gentleman named Alex Nunez, who is an independent reporter out of Providence, Rhode Island, who regular listeners may know. He's been uh, following the story of General Dynamics, a defense contractor 
that's trying to get like $100 million of corporate welfare from the state of Connecticut to help offset its costs as it readies to build the Navy's next fleet of nuclear armed ballistic missile submarines. And Ralph advised Alex to make a Freedom of Information Act request to get a copy of the contract. Alex has done that, and this is his update. He says, hi, Steve. Rhode Island shuffled me back and forth between the governor's office and the Economic Development Corporation, both of which said they were not in possession of the contract. When I inquired as to how that's possible, I was told the Economic Development Corporation is actually still negotiating the terms. So it seems the state announced a deal it hasn't even finalized. Insane, in my opinion. He's going to stay on that one. He said in Connecticut, the governor's office essentially ignored his request. He says, I was told previously by an attorney with the ACLU of Connecticut that this is common. Connecticut has the weakest freedom of information law in New England. The law requires a response to a request within four days. If rejected, the requester has to file an appeal within that time frame as well. Agencies and officials get around complying by just ignoring requests. And the ACLU told him this means you basically have to file a request and an appeal at the same time. He's pestered the governor's office about not replying. They finally responded saying they'd gathered the information for him. But based on what the ACLU told him, he'll probably have to stay on them to get this. That sounds like quite an ordeal, Ralph. Well, what do you think about all that? Well, he's persistent. That's one of the characteristics of a solid citizen activist. And I would urge him, if he has any trouble in Connecticut, our community lawyer, Charlene Lavoy, is an expert in the Connecticut Free Information Act, and she's pro bono, and he should contact her at 860-732-1262, 860-732-1262. Well, thank you, Alex, for keeping on that. Uh, keep us updated, and we'll follow up. That's our show. I want to thank our guest today, Professor Nancy McLean, author of Democracy in Chains, and Professor Timothy Woke, who uh, is an English language uh, learner professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for bonus material we call The Wrap Up. For Ralph's weekly column, go to nata.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. Visit the American Museum of Tort Law and go to tortmuseum.org and check out the Tort Museum Bookstore for grossing books and memorabilia. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Join us next week when we're going to have another stimulating show. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you very much, Steve and Jimmy. And listeners out there, again, the urging to be more active, at the town, state, national, international level, it all comes down to a small number of active people representing the spirit and opinion for a better country and world by a majority of the people. They're out there. Represent them. Give them the cutting edge of civic action on both the electoral process and in the civic arena. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Welcome to the wrap-up. We've got a lot of bonus material today where we continue our conversation with Professor Nancy McLean. First, Steve asks a question of Professor McLean about the role of evangelicals in the Koch brothers' stealth plan for America. And before we leave, uh, I'd like to have Steve Scrovan come in on this. As a Yale graduate, he's beginning to worry about all these right-wing people that go high in government like John Bolton, who graduated mm -hmm. from Yale Law School. But I'm sure he has a comment or a question. Steve? Sure. And thanks for the Yale plug there, Ralph. All this sounds like Buchanan's ideology that the Koch brothers are sort of implementing sounds very Ayn Randian, and, which is a-religious, and yet all these right-wing nationalists seem to be supported by a big part of the support is evangelical Christians. Is there a religious component to what they're doing, or is that just somehow a happy coincidence for them? I am so glad you raised that, Steve. That is so important. Many of the architects of this libertarian cause were 
just died in the wall, <laughs> atheist, right? And absolutely contemptuous of people of faith. And Ayn Rand is the most obvious example of that. And apparently there's a huge portrait of her that hangs in the lobby of the Cato Institute. Buchanan was contemptuous, you know, of his colleagues who were people of faith. It runs deeply through libertarianism. And yet these guys also began to realize that, as I said, you know, at the outset, because they know they are a permanent minority, they cannot get what they want to get unless they call cultivate allies. So what they have done is work with the religious right and actively, assiduously cultivate that. And we just saw one victory of it, you know, in the, the Supreme Court case with the essentially the freedom to discriminate, right? Religious freedom is freedom to discriminate. And so that is a crucial part of their effort. And that is another reason, too, why I've been particularly reaching out to faith groups, right? I mean, there are a lot of good Christians and Jews and Muslims out there who take their faith seriously in a positive way. And this libertarian ethical system, and there is one, believe it or not, but it is at odds with the best of every major religious tradition in the world. Every major religious tradition encourages us to be kind to the stranger, to help the refugee, to care about the poor and the sick, et cetera, et cetera. And this libertarian ethical system is contemptuous of all of that. Buchanan actually wrote a piece called The Samaritan's Dilemma, in which he argued that the ethics of Jesus, as shown through the Good Samaritan, the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, were not applicable in the modern world because the victim would try to exploit the giver. I mean, that's how serious this stuff is. So you are absolutely right to point out that that is a source of potentially significant weakness in this political project, that it is so cynically using people of faith by working with their entrepreneurial leaders who want things like Christian schools and, you know, the ability to intervene in politics to stop abortion and so forth and so on. Well, on their economic proposals, they wouldn't get 20, 25 percent in national polls. No. They're not only a minority, they're a distinct minority, and some of them wouldn't even get 10 percent. But what's interesting about this whole effort is how far it's gotten with all their zany proposals, their contradictions, their hypocrisy, their self-enrichment, their greed, their vicious mm -hmm. cruelty. They control all these democratically elected legislators, governors, president, Congress, and the courts. So that tells you how weak and smug and compromised the liberal establishment and the Democratic Party has been to allow this to happen. They should be landsliding this worst cruel Republican Party in history that would have offended Senator Robert Taft, Mr. Conservative mm -hmm. in the Senate in the 1940s and 50s, not to mention how it would have offended Eisenhower and Teddy Roosevelt. So I think the focus has not just got to be on these protagonists that you write so well about in your book, Democracy and Chains. It's got to be on why the Democratic Party and its compromised fundraising and its militarism has allowed this to happen and how this has to be changed. Because as one right-winger once told me about uh, when I talked to him about why they're winning all these elections, he said, Ralph, what you got to understand is it all comes down to beating one person in every election, yeah. whether state or federal. And mm -hmm. we've got the apparatus to beat that one person, and they don't. Yeah, I think I mean, as, a, as a friend of mine in the Working Families Party says, it took us 40 years to get this week. <laughs> so it is going to take some time to dig out of this hole. But on the other hand, you know, I will say I think there are a lot of signs that we can look to that suggest that we could be on the cusp, potentially, if enough people get engaged, of a democratic renewal of the likes of the 1860s and the 1930s and the 1960s. And I say that because of the ferment at the grassroots, because of – you know, large numbers of people who had never been involved in politics getting involved, like the indivisible groups, you know, and their members are, are so alert in so many places. The students of Parkland, the red state teachers, all of these people from all of these different domains, I think, are starting to realize that we are on an unsustainable course and we need everyone to recognize that and get active. You're also seeing that, I think, among, you know, people who are thinking hard about democracy. There is a deep consensus developing 
feeling among, you know, some of the best political scientists and, and economists that we have, that the whole system has been skewed and rigged to enable, as you say, this kind of corporate dominance or, you know, what I call property supremacy, and that it is undermining the things that we need to sustain our society. So faith groups, you know, we have Reverend Barber from my state of North Carolina is leading a new poor people's campaign. So in all these different ways, I do think there are these sprouts of hope that we can look to. And the question is whether we will nurture them, whether there will be people there to connect them, whether the damn foundations who for years, you know, pushed everybody to be in silos and to only focus on the next year or two or three instead of the long term, whether enough of them get it. But I think that, you know, there are signs of hope. And I think the more people who understand what's happening, the better off we'll be. Yeah, excuse me. The most exciting part of what you're describing is they're finally getting it by going to the electoral arena. They're running for office. They're supporting or opposing candidates up and down the ladder from local Mm -hmm. to national. That's when you know they're serious and not just pouting and protesting and demanding. I always say to people, look at American history. Almost every major movement for justice, whether it was civil rights or women's right to vote or consumer, environment, labor, never had more than 1% of the people active behind it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it succeeded is because that 1% focused on the decision makers, like members of Congress back Mm -hmm. home, and they represented majority opinion, Mm -hmm. what Abraham Lincoln called the public sentiment, without which you can't achieve much. But with, you can achieve a great deal. So it's important to give these people hope historically as a professor of history, Professor McLean, that really it's never been more than a handful of really active people with strategy, determination, going to the decision-making forum, representing majority opinion. Mm -hmm. And again and again, they can beat these forces of darkness and these corporate lobbyists. I totally agree. I teach a course on the history of U.S. social movements, and I make precisely the point that you just made that, yeah, this is how things get done in our country, and this is how they have to get done because of the way our Constitution sets things up. Then Ralph and Professor McLean talk about how to debate their right-wing libertarian opponents. Did Reason Magazine review it? (laughs) Yeah, they trashed it. I mean, you just wouldn't believe. I mean, it's also, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just absurd that the way they're that they totally bought and sold. They have a five million dollar yeah. budget, and it's all from two or three rich guys. Yeah, I know it is. It's just it's it's really actually you know I mean I wrote about this stuff so I understand, but it has been chilling and just just sickening to see how it plays out because all you know all they write is exculpatory about Buchanan and you know they don't even get to the real story because they don't want people to read the real story. I think they don't even. That's why I under- find you could you really yeah. na- nail them on their hypocrisy, Nancy. Yeah. Nail them on yeah. corporate welfare. Nail them on yeah. empire. Nail them on military budget, nail them on contracts Mm -hmm. of adhesion, you know, fine print Mm -hmm. contracts. We're going to have a big conference uh, roundtable on market fundamentalism in the fall. Oh, really? Uh That's great. I mean, that's where they, you see, you hoist them by their own petard because they won't listen to these other arguments. Mm -hmm. You basically say, look, how about this? How about that? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, think that's wise. uh, You know, open courts, that's, you know, Motherhood and apple pie, right? Why? Yeah, why are and they're they going trying to under closing, yeah. closing the courtroom door. Right. No, they're undermining the independent judiciary in my state, as we Trial speak, as we're trying to, and elsewhere, doing yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you know about these you know, protest you bills. The yeah. yeah, yeah. That's why. Yeah. Uh, that's why Henry Mann uh, did so poorly when I was debating him. Uh-huh. I just, I just hung him with his own pretensions and hypocrisy. Uh huh. Is it was that by the way? Was that recorded? Would it be possible for me to find that somewhere? It was I back just in nineteen sixty eight or seventy. Wow. I doubt it. <laughs> Place was hanging from the rafters. You know, those are the days when the kids. Yeah, yeah. Out. Wow. I would love to have seen that. In fact, I'm but, speaking at two legal things uh, this weekend and then next week. Where oh, it would just be so fun to queue up a little bit of that dialogue. <laughs> That's like one time, for example, a guy stood up in Oklahoma and he said, I don't like any regulation. I said, how about regulation of auto safety? He said, no. I said, well, uh, you mean you don't want seatbelts or airbags? He said, no. 
I said, but you have people in the car and they can be kids. Why are you making the decision as to whether they're going to live or die? It's my car. I own it. I said, yeah. okay, uh, do, you want, uh, do you want regulations uh, about cars having doors? They have to have doors. He said, no. He was totally uh, booed by the audience. Completely <laughs> lost it, you see? Yeah. You just drive yeah. it to their idiotic conclusion. Yes, yeah. And I think, as you're saying, too, know the questions to ask, because this is what drives me bonkers about the mainstream media. When these guys keep saying they're going to reform Social Security or Medicare, yeah. you know, to save it, and it's like, they don't want to reform it. They want no. to destroy it, but you That's need right. to know to ask them the question of whether they believe in social insurance, and they can't say yes. Yeah. The same thing with pharmaceutical safety. You can just hoist them on that. Yeah. You know, you, you, you know I was debated Milton Friedman once, and uh, well, he started uh, out, and I said, you know, you've written that there should doctors shouldn't be licensed. He said, that's right. Yeah. I said, well, how are people going to know whether the surgeon is trained or not? Said, Nothing can be worse than the AMA. The AMA is a cartel. Nothing can be worse. I said, you mean a butcher can decide to improve his income by taking down the butcher sign and just say, doctor, uh, yep. surgery available? And all he could say was, nothing is worse than the AMA. He looked like a fool. Yeah, exactly. You, see, you just exactly. drive, them, yeah. you just drive yeah. them to their logical conclusion. Yeah. Here's a Nobel Super Prize helpful. winner. Yeah. And he he, want, he doesn't want any kind of licensing or training requirements for doctors. The one thing he said before he fell on the sword was he said, sooner or later, people will find out who the good surgeons are. Yeah, I said, yeah, unbelievable. sooner or later. In the meantime, yeah. thousands yeah. will die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was a yeah. Princeton-sponsored in Pittsburgh well. debate. So it's easy to take these guys apart, but our yeah. side doesn't like to debate them. They can't get over the yuck factor, the ridicule, the hubris that they have. They're empirically starved. They don't like to be told that description. They're empirically yeah. so one th You know, Irving Crystal once made the mistake of debating Mark Green in New York on regular. Oh, really? Uh -huh. And they just, they virtually had to carry Irving out. Because he, <laughs> he had no facts it. whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Mark kept drilling him and drilling him. So they're empirically starved. That's why yeah. this jumped out, this thing in your book, that mm -hmm. he spurned empirical research. Imagine that, Steve. And by the way, they have hijacked Hayek and some of these other guys, as you know. Hayek hated socialism and government planning mm -hmm. and the economy, no doubt. But he opposed Medicare and Medicaid. Do you know why? Well, it was in keeping with his whole philosophy. Or, But are you going to say, would you no, say something more specific? No, because he wanted it universal. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. he, he believed he believed in public uh -huh. works and public yeah. insurance. He hated any kind of planning, of centralized planning. And of course, Adam Smith is full of those humane sentiments. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's yeah. The the falsity of their claim to being representing classical liberalism yeah. it needs to be exposed by people who know that early history well. But even even their notions that you know they're going back to the visions of the founders or of early America is patently absurd. I mean, there yeah. was widespread regulation at the local and the state level, just not the federal level. But no, none of the you know crafters of the Constitution would recognize themselves in these ideas. You know, right. not not to say that they were perfect or to you know wax nostalgic, but the idea that these guys are restoring an early America is patently absurd. No, I have a writing group, and one of the people in it was is an early American legal scholar, and she would just go ballistic as she was reading my chapters and say, these people are nuts. They don't know anything about the early republic. No, that's right. Well, you may be interested in reading my book, Unstoppable, The Emerging Oh, I definitely right. want to, yeah. yeah. On page 60, I had 24 areas where they converge, but the divide and rule strategy of the ruling classes of 2,000 years just keeps pushing this red state, blue state, you know, conservative, yeah. liberal divide. But right. if you get down to where people live, work, and raise their families, this ideology dissipates rapidly. Yeah. Because they want well, clean I'm air. They want to save food. Yeah. 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 So, I quite agree and, with and you. And the other thing yeah. about, if I, you may permit one mm -hmm. lasting criticism of academics, and my sister pointed out she taught at Berkeley 55 years in anthropology, is mm -hmm. the academic research does not pick up on the empirical civic research of citizen groups. Yes. So, uh -huh. so you'll have people writing about the pharmaceutical industry and not even citing the health research group and all the documentation yeah. of Dr. Sidney Wolf. Yeah. The same with auto safety and so on. It's amazing. When uh -huh. you look at the index, it's staggering mm -hmm. 
disinterest. Whereas the right wing, when they get a mm-hmm. professor on their side, look what mm-hmm. they do. They pay yeah. him huge money and right. send him here and there and, and cite him and help mm-hmm. him produce his books and her books and so on. Yeah. So that's really a problem you might want to talk with your academic colleagues about. Yeah, there's a lot of things I need to be talking to them about. <laughs> but there are some people starting to do more, you know, the Scholar Strategy Network and the Roosevelt Institute and, you know, other kinds of local things. We actually helped launch a group here in North Carolina after the 2010 midterms and, you know, when all hell broke loose here called Scholars for North Carolina's Future that I was co-chair of. And we organized people from, it was over, what was it, 60 campuses. We had a couple hundred people. We couldn't sustain, we couldn't get foundations to support us even enough to hire an organizer. In the end, we couldn't sustain it. It was very frustrating because I was like co-chairing it and doing organizing while I was also researching and writing this book and (laughs) teaching and everything else. And it just, it couldn't be done. But I do think there's a lot of potential out there at this moment. Yeah, let me give you a a website. This is eight days we had at Constitutional Hall in 2006 called Breaking Through Power. Uh Just go to breakingthroughpower.org. Okay. 162 presenters from academia to the civic arena, judicial Uh arena. And it was very hard to get people out, and the press blacked it out. So this is happening all over the country. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think we have to start doing what the other side does, which is meeting with editorial boards and, you know, having validators out there to to explain what's actually going on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have to continue with the program. Thank you very much, Nancy. All right. Thank you so much. It's really, really been so stimulating. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap. Send in your questions or leave us a comment in the comments section on the website, and we may read it on the air. Thanks for listening, and join us again next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour.